Okay, so I'm test driving. Test driving. Test driving to see if my new microphone works. I think it's working. Okay, you might have noticed that I've had some coffee today. Don't tell anyone. If you don't tell anyone, I won't tell anyone because I'm not allowed to have coffee. Okay, so what are we going to do today? Well, I want to talk to you all about archiving artwork. Yes, it's one of those art businessy day talks. And I love talking about art businessy related things. So I thought, let's start with archiving. So what does archiving even mean? Well, what I mean by archiving is either taking photographs of your work or scanning your artwork. And what are the pros, of, pros and cons of both of those methods of archiving? And why do we need to archive our work anyway? And what are the benefits of our archiving? So basically, archiving your work means taking a record of it or making a record of it. And there's different ways to make a record of your artwork. So it doesn't matter if you do three-dimensional artwork or if you do, do two-dimensional artwork. I do mostly two-dimensional artwork, but there are some three-dimensional artworks that I also do. For instance, this lovely lady over here, a fiberglass sculpture that I made some, some years ago, is a three-dimensional artwork, right? So how would we archive a three-dimensional artwork? Well, we can't really scan it. Or maybe we can. I don't know. Do you know if there's any scanners that can archive uh, three-dimensional artwork? I don't know of any, but as technology evolves, there might actually be some. But the ones that I'm going to tell you about are photographing and scanning. So if you do two-dimensional work, a scanner is always the best method. Photography can also be really good, but you have to have a professional photographer to take photos of your artwork. So for your three-dimensional work, you're gonna wanna use a photo photographer. Now, you might be really good at taking photographs, but if you want really professional quality photographs, JPEGs in other words, you'll wanna get a professional photographer, right? You'll need really good lighting and a really good camera and all of that costs some money, right? So your best bet might be going to one of those print, print stores where they can take professional grade photographs of your two-dimensional artwork. Now keep in mind that there is a cost every time you take your artwork to be either photographed or scanned. I think as a bit small business owner, be it any kind of small business owner, the best thing that you can opt for is to Buy your own equipment little by little. All of these equipments are obviously costly. So you will, you'll want to buy these things little by little so it doesn't feel like a huge burden all at once. Now let me tell you about my best investment that I think I've ever made in my artistic career. It's a scanner, an art grade scanner. We're not talking about your regular scanner that you use to scan documents with, but a professional grade art scanner. The reason why I use an art scanner is because when you photograph your artwork, even if you are a really good photographer, some of the images turn out warped and you can't really get that 90 degree angle at the bottom and at the top of um, the image after photographing it. But when you scan the artwork, it comes out perfect. So let me tell you a little bit more about my investment that I made 11 years ago. I bought a professional art scanner called Epson Expression 10,000 XL. It can scan on one go images uh, up to 16 inches by 12 inches. That's a pretty good size drawing or painting, right? But here's the thing, you can also scan artworks that are much larger than that. So if you saw my last video, you would have seen the painting that I made 
a commission painting that was 50 by 40 inches big. So that's about uh, 120 centimeters by 100 centimeters wide. That's a big painting. And you can scan a large painting that size too. Granted, it does take a little bit of work. You have to scan it in sections, but then you use Photoshop to stitch those sections together and you get one single image or a JPEG in other words. What I love about my, my scanner is that the images that it captures are absolutely beautiful, crisp and clear. And the resolution that I normally use for my paintings is 300 DPI. So DPI stands for dots per inch. So what that basically means is that within one inch squared, there's 300 dots in there. Now, without getting too technical about it, basically what that means is that the res resolution is really high. Now, the higher the resolution is, the larger the file size. Now, a good thing to remember is that you need to keep your file, file sizes relatively manageable. 300 still is still manageable. Even 400 is manageable for small paintings. Now, really small paintings such as this one, I would scan using 400 DPIs. And the reason why I do that is because smaller works can actually, well, they take less space on your computer, so you can still use a higher, even a higher resolution like 400 DPI to capture that image. So I want to take you down memory lane a little bit and tell you what I've been doing for the past three and a half decades. Yes three and a half decades. I know that says I'm already quite old. What's old anyway, right? Well, I'm proud to say that I have been archiving my work since I was 16 years old. Yes, I have. So when I was 16 years old, I wanted to be an artist. I already knew that that was what I wanted to do. So something told me, start archiving your work. And I wanted to show you how I did that. So I'm looking at these images here just to make sure that I show you ones that I actually want to show because some of them are really quite awful. Let's be honest, I mean they were quite awful, but here's something I'd like to share with you. So this album is from 1988 and that's when I started to archive my very first works and I was between 16 and 17 or something like that. So here's a painting I made of a friend. It has a little bit of a Gustav Klimt feeling to it. I was actually quite proud of that work back then and then this one was a painting I just made out of my mm, memory. And um, when I had my first, very first exhibition in a library, this was the very first painting I ever sold. So had I not archived the work, I wouldn't have that memory. I love these memories. And seeing your work go back, you can see how your work has evolved how your vo visual uh, voice has changed and you get to see basically the, how everything has progressed and changed over the years. So anyway, this album is from the 1980s. Then there's another album. I think this is, this one is 1991 through 1992. And then here's another one that goes up to 95. Some drawings are made uh, with pastel onto paper. So yeah, all of these are photographs of my works. And with the photographs, we have these old fashioned 
what are they called? Oh my God, I can't remember. Negatives, negatives. See, I can't even remember because we don't use those words anymore. So go look and then look at this. Do you know what these are? These are slides. And I couldn't remember that word this morning either because I haven't used that word forever. So slides, here's an, it. give me just a minute. So I'm gonna show you here against this white background, a painting. This is a fairly large painting that I made back then in 95 when I finished art school. And if I did not have that slide, I wouldn't be able to make prints or anything out of it now. But there's actually an Epson expression. I, not, not the one I have, but I know that there is one that exists that actually can scan the slide and you can make really high resolution images from that scanned slide. Isn't that great? Okay, so, and then the next thing, the next form of archiving was CDs. I'm sure you've seen a CD before. So these are images from the early 2000s that I would capture onto CDs. And back then I did not have my own scanner. So I had to go to one of those professional art printer places and they would scan the artwork for me and then they would put the JPEGs on the CD for me. And that was a way for me to use those images for printing and for other purposes too. Okay, so here are some benefits to having a really high resolution image of your artwork. Number one, you can use that image to make prints. You can make art prints, you can make greeting cards or postcards or t-shirts, mugs, merchandise, whatever you can think of. Number two, you can license that image to a third party. Now licensing is a wonderful way to make some extra revenue. In case you didn't know. I haven't licensed my work very much. I think I've only licensed it maybe once or twice to a third party. But if you make artwork that's a little bit more on the graphic side, you might have some luck actually licensing your artwork to a company that makes, say, textiles, clothing, or merchandise, such as mugs, plates, anything that is let's say brandable. A third point, you, when you want to apply to an art gallery, say that you want to have an exhibition. Well, you're gonna to have to send those images to an art gallery and art galleries always want to see really beautiful, high quality images of your artwork. This makes your artwork look really professional and they can get a really good idea of what that original artwork looks like if you have that really good photo. Okay, so after art galleries comes social media images, right? So on social e media, you'll want to have really beautiful images too, because you want people to be drawn by your art, right? But remember not to have really high resolution images on your social media or even on your website, because you don't want those copyright issues over you, you and your art, right? You don't want somebody in, I was going to say a country's name, but maybe I shouldn't say it here on social media. So never mind, scratch that. You don't want somebody over there really far away, you know what I'm talking about? Copying your artwork. So normally the, Pixels I use on my website are around 800, 900 pixels. And I use a resolution of 72 and quality of the image would be around nine, no more than nine. That way you're protecting your image from those 
people copying it. Now there are ways to avoid that too, by you, you can use a watermark on your image to avoid a third party from copying your artwork, but I don't really use those watermarks because I don't know, I just feel like they take away from the art and it just looks weird. So um, I think if you keep your image rather small, then you're okay. So it's a win-win in every way. The more beautiful your artwork uh, images look online, the more drawn people will be to your art world. Okay, so what we're going to do next is if you saw my last video, you'll know that I finished that really large commission painting. And I'm going to show you how to actually scan that large painting now. So I thought that would be the next project that we would be doing. <laughs> So I've set up the area where I'm going to scan my large painting and basically all I did was was to put some stools here around the scanner so that I have an, uh, an area where to lay the, the canvas on, somewhere to support it. As you can see the scanner is not huge, it's not tiny either, but it's not big enough to support a canvas that is 50 by 40 inches. So we have to have something where we can actually lay down the painting, especially if we're doing the scanning on our own. Now, obviously it would be the best case scenario if we had somebody to help us. But again, most of the things that I have to do in the studio, I do them by myself. So I have to figure out ways to, to work around that. Now, before we start scanning, we have to clean the surface of the scanner really well. And I've prepared some vinegar water here. So there is one part vinegar and nine parts of water in there. And this is a perfect solution that you can use to clean the, the window screen on. You can also use a window cleaner, but I prefer to use natural products. So vinegar will be just fine. I try not to get any water towards the edges of the screen just to avoid any moisture from getting into the scanner. So I'm basically cleaning the middle part of the scanner and then going towards the edges with a really dry area of the cloth. So the scanner is now turned on and we're going to grab the painting and lay it down and get started. The tricky part is getting it on there without scratching it. So try not to drag the painting at any moment. Lift it up and carefully place it in its new position. If you drag it, you're going to get scratch marks on the painting. I'm going to move you back a little bit. So you can see see the whole canvas and what I'm doing. Now before I used to take the canvas off of the stretchers to scan it without the stretcher bars on it and I found that really helpful for mid-sized paintings but for large paintings I realized that it wasn't really a good idea to do that because what happens is that when you take the canvas off of the stretcher bars obviously the canvas goes limp and when I was moving it around on the scanner I noticed some scratch marks started to form on the canvas as it's bumping against the sides of the scanner. So I tried this method and it seemed to work just fine. There were some issues I was having Photoshop in the end when I was trying to stitch the images together. I had some problems there, but I'll tell you about that later and how to fix that. So what you need at this point is a piece of cardboard, um, a slightly thicker piece of cardboard is the best, 
and this is just so that I can hold it all the way down and get the canvas that's in the corner to stick to the scanner as much as I can possibly get it to stick. And then you'll need two books, one large one and then a smaller one, probably a heavy one would be best so we can actually get some weight onto the canvas. So at this point, make sure that it's aligned so that you have at least an inch and a half on each side of the screen of blank space. And the reason why you want to do that is because when you go into Photoshop at the very last stage of scanning to stitch your images together, it'll help you in the stitching process. You won't have so many problems. Then you need a black piece of cloth. Or plastic and this is so that you don't get any light coming in from the sides of the scanner so this is all set up and I have my scanner program open on my computer and I'm just gonna hit scan and then I'll come back really fast to hold this down uh, especially here on the very end edge of the painting and we're going to use a pencil to make little markings on the canvas just so that we know which area we've already scanned. So I marked it number one. This is the very first image that we've scanned. And now we're going to move the canvas this way and scan this area here. I just wanted to add a little note there about the three-dimensional scanners. The three-dimensional scanners, scanners actually do exist, but I don't think they're really intended for artistic purposes, like in the sense of being an artist and documenting your artwork. They're more intended for designers, like product designers and such, maybe cinematography too. But um, yeah, for for artistic purposes, a flatbed art scanner is what we would normally use. So I just wanted to add that in there in case any of you were thinking that I missed, um, missed that. Now, again, I'm only talking from my own experience and my experiences has, have been with using actual cameras and scanners. I've never used anything other than that, now technology is moving forwards all the time and we might be seeing new forms of documenting our work in the, in the future. So yeah, there you go. <laughs>